Yeah, this is the title of the conference, by the way. Um, and I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for what I've found a very stimulating and eye-opening uh, uh, meeting. Uh, much of it, I have, to be frank, not been aware of these rapid developments relating microscopic quantum uh, systems uh, to black holes. And I shall only peripherally be talking about black holes. So I want to explain that to begin with. And then I'll tell you what I'm actually going to be talking about. Um, when uh, the program first came out, uh, Malcolm Perry was um, down to speak on the work that he and Strominger and Hawking have been doing about soft hair for black holes. And I had got interested in this subject and tried to understand it from my own point of view. Uh, and so I thought I would be giving a commentary uh, to, to that. As you will see, in what I'm actually going to talk about, uh, I'm going to begin by talking about what's called Carroll symmetry, which has been part of what I've been doing for a few years, particularly here in, uh, in, particularly here in France. Uh, and then I'm going to give an application of this, in some sense, to problems in black hole theory. Uh, and, and I'm going to be talking in a very elementary way about um, the topics here, gravitational memory and the notion of, this, of a soft graviton. And you should take this in the following spirit, that for me, the concept of a soft graviton, which arises from S-matrix theory, and it's very much a quantum notion, is extremely strange. And I'm trying to translate it into a language that an old-fashioned and increasingly aged relativist uh, can understand. Okay. So uh, the people I've been mostly working with over the past few years on this are Christian Duval from Marseille, Peter Horvati who's from Tours, and Peng Ming Zhang who's from Lanzhou. Uh, and uh, it came out of a stay of four years or so at LMP in, uh, LMTP pardon, in Tours, which was supported, I have to say this of course, by uh, a, a, um, an outfit called Le Studium, uh, for which I'm very grateful. And I'm also grateful for uh, Sergei Solodukin, who, uh, with whom I've also participated, but not with these particular subjects, uh, who uh, was the host there, the official host, and extremely helpful for me. So, and I want to thank anyone, uh, everyone else from TOUR who uh, uh, was very hospitable, including Stan Nicholas. So the first part of my talk is meant to be a kind of overview of what is known as the Carroll Group. And I'm not going to assume that any of you know what the Carroll Group is. And I'm trying to be pedagogic, so do interrupt me if it doesn't make any sense, etc., etc. And the second is an application to plain gravitational waves, which are particularly exciting and interesting solutions in uh, general relativity. They are non-linear versions of the gravitons everybody speaks about and will be speaking about, I understand, in a few minutes after my talk. But that's the LIGO team. And so I want to extract from this theory a notion of a soft graviton and the relationship with what is uh, in the minds of Strominger and, uh, and, and uh, Perry and Hawking is that uh, their idea is that uh, as information, as, as, as material, Oh, go, goes outwards, or as collapse takes place, the Hawking process takes place, but mainly as collapse takes place, gravitational waves can be emitted from the black hole, and somehow they carry the information, that's hair that's not been taken into account by the standard no hair theorems. So what is that hair? What is it, and can you use it uh, to uh, unravel or measure things about the interior of the black hole? That's their program. Uh, and uh, I'm just going to give you a commentary on what the notion of soft hair actually is in this context by approximating an outgoing roughly spherical wave with a plane wave. Now the contents of the first, uh, I'm given a quite long content group. The way I view these uh, Carroll and Galileo groups is as kinematic groups, I'll tell you what that is, these are the kind of groups you can expect to arise in physics if you have rotational invariance, if you have translational invariance of some sort that don't have to commute, and uh, you also have some idea of passing to a moving frame. In other words, you have boosts. You try to classify all groups of that structure, and uh, 
for every one of these groups, uh, of which the Carroll group is uh, one and the Galileo is another, uh, you get a, a kind of privileged flat space-time structure. And then, as in general relativity, you can make it wiggle and get a curved version of the same structure. Uh, these are all related, or the two ones that are important for us, Newton, to, uh, Galileo and Carroll, in this context, uh, uh, to a higher dimensional structure, a Bargman structure. Uh, the Bargman group is that extension of the Galileo group that you need to take into account when you consider boosts, because Galileo and boosts act on the wave function by a phase, as well as, of course, a shift of the arguments of the wave function. And, uh, so there's a bunch of uh, other groups which leave invariant uh, these structures. There are various isomorphisms, which I'll mention on passant. But the uh, interesting point here is the BMS group is a version of the Carroll group. And that's how I came to it. Now, the BMS group is a group of asymptotic symmetries of space-time and is intimately related to, uh, to the kind of soft physics, if I may say so without being pejorative, <laughs> of uh, Strominger and uh, Perry and, and Hawking and many others, of course. Then I'll give the applications, and I have in mind as applications what I've said. Okay, so our idea is to look at non-Einsteinian relativity. People often think of Newton's theory as non-relativistic. Well, that's garbage. It's relativistic, it just has Galileo's principle of relativity, which isn't Einstein's. Uh, okay, so, and I'm looking at it from a space-time point of view, which Galileo and Newton didn't quite do. Uh, and in our context, the principle of relativity involves a notion of the invariance of physical laws under passing to a mov moving frame, and we're going to interpret this as a symmetry of some kind of space-time structure. So that's the framework in which we're working. Uh, and we're following uh, the path pioneered actually here in France by Bacri and Levi Leblanc many years ago, who found all algebras containing, there's some slight extra assumptions, rotations and spatial and temporal translations and boosts. And all of these may be regarded as the wigner ionio contractions of the two de Sitter groups. Now, if we weren't interested in boosts, we'd be doing something that was done many years ago by Klein and Helmholtz. We'd be classifying Aristotelian space-times, as they're sometimes called, because the three congruence geometries are basically cosets which include rotations and boosts, uh, sorry, rotations and translations. And if you just set yourself up to make uh, a space of that sort, uh, which was called uh, the axiom of free mobility by Helmholtz, you land up with the three congruence geometries we use in robertson Walker. <coughs> so now we just add the time direction, see what we get. Okay, well here's a diagram which explains this lot. So they, they found uh, basically uh, eight of these groups. Uh, actually, they confounded these or conflated these two. Uh, they didn't distinguish between ADS and DS, but I have done. So this box, these vertices, show you the big daddy up here and arrows going away and the arrows are contractions. So for example, you can uh, let the velocity of light go to infinity and you get the newton hook group. More familiarly, you can go along this direction and get the Poincaré group by allowing the leg scale in the ADS group to go uh, to infinity. And uh, once you've got the Poincaré group, well, if you let the velocity of light go to infinity, you get the Galilean group. So most of those you're familiar with, there's a sort of reflection in this plane here, because this is negative lambda and this is positive lambda. But what about going this direction? Well, the one that I'm going to be talking about is the Carroll group, and that's when you let the velocity of light go to zero. And uh, that uh, could have many applications. OK, so that's written here in terms of what you need to do. Newton Hook, you have to be a bit clever about taking uh, lambda to zero, uh, but you also take C goes to infinity. And so you get the time, and that time is related to the period of an oscillator, the oscillator being a regular oscillator in the positive lambda case, uh, and uh, sorry, in the negative lambda case, and uh, an upside-down oscillator. So uh, these are how it goes. And actually, there's a certain duality between the Galileo and Carroll groups. Um, you can think of it this way. 
we all know that we have a light cone in, in Einstein's version of relativity. Uh, what you can do is open it up like this. This is Galilean physics where you can travel as fast as you like or you can close it down, shrink it to a line element and that means you can't travel anywhere actually. You've got absolute uh, space so you can't move. Here you've got absolute time. Um, now each of these has a space-time structure and there is a duality which is really inverting, uh, as we'll see, passing from the um, uh, uh, physical space to the tangent space or from uh, tangent space to cotangent space. So if you like the wave-particle duality discovered by de Broglie is simply that when you go to the opposite space you get the same light cone. That's how he invented it, in fact. By, he had his eye on relativity, as far as I can tell from what's written. Okay, now uh, this uh, thing happens frequently in applications when you have ultra-local theories. You throw away spatial gradients in your theory and turn them into quantum mechanics or um, particle on a line or something. So actually, the Carroll group should have an application to much of what has been talked about today in this meeting, but I'm not going to uh, discuss that in, in detail. Okay. Um, and all of these kinematic groups have a flat invariant model space-time and it allows uh, curving. Now, for Galileo, this is well known and known since uh, Cartan's time, um, and uh, it's a space-time, so it has the same number of coordinates as uh, what we think of as Minkowski space-time, but it has a degenerate co-metric whose kernel are these normals. They are the one forms that give these, uh, sorry, these, these constant time surfaces. Okay. Corallian space-time has a degenerate metric whose kernel is a vector and that vector is the direction that we go in. Okay, so to make that Okay, I mean, I like to characterize this whole Corollian business to quote uh, the much not lamented uh, Mrs. Thatcher. She used to say whenever she had a policy, uh, Mrs. May, uh, if you follow English politics, has got some kind of, uh, she's trying to use the same slogan, Tina, there is no alternative. Okay, well, I hope that's intuitively clear. And the name comes from Lewis Carroll from this famous quotation, well in our country, said Alice, still panting a little, you generally get somewhere else if you run very fast for a long time, as we've been doing. A slow sort of country, said the Queen. Now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast. Okay. And the key point is the boosts act differently. Uh, this is how uh, Galilean boosts act and Corollian boosts act. They change the time but not the x. That's why x is absolute. I mean, there are translations, but... Uh, and I, I like to introduce two different times. T is Newtonian time or Galilean time and S is Corollian time. And that will make, I hope, some things rather manifest and clear. In one plus one dimension, there's no difference. So uh, this is Lewis Carroll, who's sort of off the slide. This is Galileo. You can interchange them. So in the string theory literature, people talk about Galilean algebras, conformal Galilean algebras, but they could as well talk about um, uh, Carroll algebras. The classification will be the same. Now, to see what's going on here, uh, let's consider the contravariant metric uh, on... Uh, or the contravariant tensor, which is the inverse of the, me of the metric in Minkowski space. You see, you've got 1 over c squared here, and uh, you can take c to infinity with impunity, it just kills the first term, and that gives you the definition, really, of a Newton-Cartan space-time. It's some manifold, some degenerate co covariant twice symmetric tensor with a one-dimensional kernel, a connection, which would be the analogue of the uh, levi civita but this is all you could do, which uh, leaves invariant the kernel. 
and uh, it's a D plus one dimensional manifold and we'll find that there are lots of uh, significant examples uh, shortly. On the other hand, uh, if you look at the metric itself, it's got C squared here, it's no good taking that to infinity but you can take it to zero and then you just lose this slot here. And that motivates the definition of a Corollian space-time as a quadruple with C, this degenerate metric now, a vector field and a connection. And you'd probably want the whole lot to be left invariant. Okay. So, uh, so those are the basic structures we'll be thinking about. And we'll the new one is Corollian. The standard flat case is uh, pretty clear. And uh, the, it's easy to check that uh, this is part of the isometry group, which is infinite dimensional. That is an arbitrary function of the spatial variables, will still leave nothing invariant. Uh, and if you want to get a finite dimensional group, uh, you re can restrict this, but then you've got to demand that it preserves the connection. So the standard translation in affine space is preserved, that restricts F, and you get this finite dimensional group sitting up here, which was invented by Le uh, Levi Leblanc actually before the classification. There are other guys who were uh, active at the time. Uh, I think it's, uh, there, there's a, somebody called Sen, uh, and it was part of the sort of fact that mostly what people did in the 60s was group theory and particle physics. So anyhow, um, so that's the picture here. And uh, all kinematic groups have a description in terms of Lorentzian geometry in four plus one dimensions. And that's what's kind of interesting. And that's what's going to come in with the gravitational waves. Now, everybody knows about kaluza klein theory. So you get ordinary Lorentz geometry uh, by doing a trans uh, going down on a translation. Now, Newton-Cartan space-time arises from a reduction of a null translation, which we'll see in a bit more detail. Uh, I don't know who, this was first seen by uh, Christian Duval and colleagues who were trying to understand Galileo invariance in a nice way uh, and has come to be used in the supergravity theory uh, in more recent times. Uh, now, um, you can think of reduction as push forward if you know any geometry uh, and the other thing you can do in geometry is pull back. So if you want to make a, you know, a cheap reputation, you start pulling back and pushing forward and uh, you get something new. Corollian space-time arises as the pullback to a null hyperplane. And in fact, what I'm going to say is, given any null surface, for example, future null infinity, uh, Corollian structures come into play. And that's why a lot of people have been doing Corollian physics without calling it that. Okay. Let's see. Uh, okay. Uh, at this level, are there any questions about the basic idea? Okay, everybody happy or asleep? And um, <laughs> sorry. So, uh, so actually, you were saying that you're replacing c by one by c. No, no, no. I'm replacing c by zero. <laughs> no, no, no. For the Galilean, it is c goes to zero, and for the Galilean, the c goes to infinity. Ah, uh, exactly. So c goes to somehow it is invertible. Is there some? Inverse. Well, there's a, there, it's not quite invertible. You see, this duality, it's, 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 it's just a, reversing the arrows. Yeah, I'm just, that is what I'm asking. This, uh, some subgroup of SL2Z actually acts on this. Uh, it goes to C, goes to 1 by C. Okay, let me, let me answer that now in the next few minutes. Uh, I'll tell you what, how, it, how it looks like, uh, perhaps in more precise ways. Uh, any other? If, uh, if pushing forward and pullback is going to be important in the future of your talk, maybe you should re-explain non-experts what it means, really. Uh, or you are not going, it's just... Uh, okay, okay. Uh, like yeah, yeah, no, no, I'll draw, okay, okay. The little basic point is that... Um, <laughs> suppose you've got a curve here and you've got a map between these guys, you can take the, the curve like that, and you can do that for any tensor, and that's because the Jacobian you're looking at, you need powers of, of this guy, and you multiply it. It doesn't have to be invertible. Okay? On the other hand, if you've got some gadget here, you can pull it back here, but what you need is this thing the upside down way. And that means that uh, you can pull back um, covectors. 
Okay. And uh, for example, uh, if you have um, a map from a manifold here into some other manifold, let's say this is space time and this is some sub manifold, uh, you can uh, now, because the metric on this gadget is covariant, you can pull it back to here. Okay? And, and so, the induced metric on a sub-manifold is the pullback onto the sub-manifold of the metric in the big embedding space. Okay? And to say it's a null surface is to say that when you've pulled it back, it has uh, less than maximal rank, one less than maximal rank. It's got a light cone structure. So let's take a null hyperplane. A null hyperplane looks something like this, and there's a definite null direction on that. And that's the zero. That's the guy along which there's no alternative. If you want to stay there, you've got to travel at the velocity of light. Is that okay with everybody now? But you can, of course, in the language of uh, homolo homological algebra or something, think of just reversing algebra uh, arrows. We speak yeah. of covariant and contravariant tensors. Yeah, yeah. Exactly that. Yeah, I know, exactly. Yeah, it's just, just one way of thinking about it. Why, why, in this language, Carolian space time, so they put back to a null surface? Why uh, well, I'll show you the, how that works in, in detail in, in, in a, something like the next overhead. Oh, wait a minute. I won't go into this, this is something technical about it. Okay, um, now, uh, uh, I want to give you Minkowski space in um, <coughs> these, uh, advan these light cone coordinates. So these will be x plus, x minus. And uh, if you write down all of these uh, generators of isometries, you've got some boosts, you've got some null translations, etc. And uh, now the point is that um, the various groups we should be interested in are the groups that I've listed here. Forget these two because they have to do with very special relativity. I'm not going to talk about that. The Corollian group is the span of these translations, these rotations, not all the rotations necessarily. Well, they're all the two-dimensional rotations. And then a null <laughs> translation and some uh, boost. Now, these all leave, inver leave invariant the surface u equals constant. That's how I picked them out. That's the null hyperplane. And uh, in this picture, uh, the way you think of it, you look sideways on, <coughs> and uh, the axes are basically, um, I've got to get this right, u and v. So this hyperplane, u equals constant, is the one which the Carroll group leaves invariant. Okay. So if you're in five dimensions and leave it invariant, uh, this is a four-dimensional hyperplane. It's got it's ruled by these null generators, and those are the absolute time uh, directions. Okay. <coughs> this kind of picture will be important in what follows. Um, okay. I hope that's. Okay, now uh, there's something called a Bargman manifold because what we're going to be doing is saying we're going to take this space and you look at everything. I said you get the Carroll group by everything that leaves invariant, u equals constant. You get the Galilean group, so this is the original uh, discussion. You get the Galilean group by taking a null vector like this guy here and asking everything that commutes with it, because that's to push you down on a null direction uh, onto a, a, a quotient space. And everything that commutes with that, well, you, don't, uh, you, you actually want something which normalizes this vector, because it will commute with the projection. It will consist either of moving up the v direction or something which uh, is, it can be thought of as living on the, on the quotient. So, uh, that is an extra generator which you don't see because when you're looking on the quotient, you've factored it out. But that is the central extension of Bargman. So all this looks a bit uh, complicated, so here is the very easy way to see it. Uh, I'll come back to that definition. 
Suppose you want to solve the massless wave equation in, uh, higher di in five dimensions with one time. Well, the massless wave equation is just this operator here. Okay? This operator, this is just d2 by dt squared plus uh, a spatial thing. It's just the way you write. And this guy is just the regular Laplace operator in three dimensions. Why are there two phi's? Uh, uh, typo. All uh, oh right, I hadn't noticed that. Yeah, it's actually on a function phi. I beg your pardon. Okay, now if you Fourier transform uh, in the in this v direction, which I'm now calling s, so s is is my uh, uh, Corollian time, uh, then I get and I get a psi of x, t and x, it's a triviality to see it satisfies the Schrodinger equation. <coughs> and we all know the Schrodinger equation commutes with Galilean transformations up to a phase. That's the Bargman group. If you threw away the phase, uh, then you get the Galilean group. So uh, these three lines with this typo corrected are all you really need to know about these sophisticated ideas. Um, and um, this is why Newton never saw the Bargman group, or well, neither did Galileo. It, they wouldn't even think about it. It's a phase that's invisible unless you're in quantum mechanics, and it's not really there. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, so the standard Newton Cartan uh, structure which is to have time and space, is obtained by pushing forward the flat Bargman structure to the quotient, sometimes called the light-like shadow. So you think of all the physics in this five-dimensional world just projected down by light, light rays onto some um, screen. Now the screen has to be thought of in terms of a vector space quotient, because it's a projection. Uh, it's, uh, uh, and. Uh, and the, uh, the Bargman group consists of the isometries which preserve this vector field which is pushing you down. Uh, you can uh, also obtain uh, the central extension of the conformal Schrodinger group, which is the sy symmetry of the free Schrodinger equation, which people are interested in, by considering conformal transformations of this Bargman structure which commute with the projection. So it's a, a nice language for discussing these sorts of things. And you can make it uh, wiggly by defining a Bargman manifold as a triple, BG and uh, Xi. And uh, basically, a Bargman manifold is a manifold with Lorentzian metric and invertible, that means, uh, a, a null vector field, which is covariant constant, or parallel, as they say, with respect to the levi civita connection. Uh, and the standard Bargman manifold is just flat, and here you see I've got my two times. Instead of u and v, I've called them t and s. And this is basically Galilean time, and this is Carolian time, if you like. Okay. <coughs> and the standard one is, is what I've just said. Um, you just take the flat one. But if you want a curved one, uh, you get... So the standard, uh, to say it again, Carroll structure is obtained by pulling back the flat Bargman structure to a null hypersurface. Okay. Now there's one distinction between the Carroll group. Uh, as you well know, you could discover the central extension of the uh, Galilean group purely algebraically. You just add something to the algebra and get it to close and check your uh, Bianchi, uh, your um, Jacobi uh, identities. The same kind of arguments will tell you that there is no central extension to the Carroll group. It's more or less what uh, Suryo did. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Although, of course, he did it in such a language that no human <laughs> being can understand. No, it's quite close to what he did. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay. Okay. Now, uh, you can make non-standard Corollian structures simply by taking the product of some Riemannian manifold with the, with the reals. You give the metric value zero on that guy, <laughs> and you give the... This, you choose any metric you like, which is Riemannian and uh, that will give you what you want. And now you have to choose a connection, and one way would be to choose the levi civita connection associated to this space. So those give you some interesting examples, and uh, here are... Um, uh, oh, you can also define a conformal group. Uh, 
by defining an automorphism which leaves invariant this degenerate metric and leaves up to a scale the vector field. And uh, this is like a conformal weight. In fact, it's related in simple cases to the conformal weight you use in conformal mechanics or whatever. And the main point is that the killing vector, a flat killing vector structure uh, has this enormous family of vector fields. And this guy is called the super translation because it depends on many. It's like a translation, but it depends upon many variables. And it's moving you up this direction uh, uh, in, in U space in this case. Um, OK, so you've met these before, actually, but not known them. It's like, uh, uh, what was the man's name? Monsieur qui parle pro? Jordan. Jordan, yeah. OK. So in his integer? You can take your pick, but it's just, you know, conformal weights can be anything you like. Uh, I called it an integer because, you know, that's convenient. I'll give you a couple of examples where you've seen these. Uh, so the first one is uh, take S1 with its angle d theta squared, and then uh, we get uh, diff S1, which is uh, with the semi -pro uh, direct product of uh, tra super translations. So this is a standard uh, Virasoro or Witt algebra that you get. So that's rather trivial. The next one is much more interesting. Take the two sphere, n equals two, and you take its conformal group, which is PSL2C, unless you have some defects in the sphere. The defects correspond to what people call super rotations. And you take this uh, semi-direct product and you get uh, where the t's are thought of as half densities and you get what's called the bondi metzner sachs group. So that was discovered quite independently of these considerations by considering asymptotically flat manifolds uh, in general relativity and uh, containing uh, uh, radiation. The asymptotic symmetry is much larger than the Poincaré group which was anticipated and so you can think of the theory of asymptotic uh, gravitational radiation as basically the theory of the BMS group. The super translations act on the null generators, so you should think of, if you've see, we've seen this picture in this, uh, in this talk, in this conference, this is scry plus, it's a half cone, here are the null generators. You can think of this as a line bundle over S2, uh, and the thing is, it, to coordinatize it, you need a section, but there's no global section because these ends, in general, uh, are singular. If you're actually talking about a real physical space-time, uh, this is a singular end, so there's no way of defining what the origin is of these generators, i.e. what the zero section is. And uh, equally well, you cannot make a correlation between the, the generators here. So the asymptotic symmetry group of a general space-time will be expected to be BMS, in, in the future and BMS in the past. Now our friends, Stroman... For the four-dimensional. For four-dimensional, yeah. Higher dimensional, there's no such thing. The asymptotics are different, but I live in four dimensions, right? For this talk. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that's a problem with, with I think, the... Uh, the uh, Hawking, Strominger, and Perry proposal is one of many. One, another one is they believe that there is a rule for making this and this, isom you know, an isomorphism between them. I don't understand the rule, but they refer to the, the god of the subject, Demetrius Christodoulou. So. And if anyone understands him, uh, talk to me quickly. It existed in all dimensions. You know, you can define it formally, and I once did, uh, and you can define it superversion in all dimensions. But the trouble is that to make it really work, you've got to know that there are solutions of the Einstein equations which have sufficient regularity that this is a legitimate symmetry. And it's been established more or less incontestably that this is not generically the case in higher dimensions. That means actually... Which symmetry are you... BMS symmetry. So the S matrix in principle should be BMS times BMS, right? Uh, it is believed by some people that you can go to the diagonal group, but this is only in four dimensions. You can formally define the BMS group in any dimension, using the procedure I just gave you, but the boundary conditions and the asymptotics of realistic metrics forbid 
these actions to be smooth. So the S matrix, if it exists, who knows? But it certainly isn't BMS. In, it carries BMS. Right? Uh, and can you comment on the extension of SL2C to the conformal, uh, the full conformal group? What do you think of that? Um, well, it's what you need to get the formulae to work out in a nice way. You could, you, you want to be saying there's a certain notion of a conformal group of scry, uh, which it's preserving, a conformal structure of scry, which it's performing. Of them which are singular on this synthetic sphere, then you have the infinite dimensional conformal group. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can do that. But that is what they call super rotations. Yeah. Uh, that's valid if for some reason you're not asymptotically flat, but you've got some punctures. So if you had a flux tube coming through, they, or you might have a, 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 a what is rather like Taub nut, an interpretation of Taub nut is a null strut, a, a string that's running through it. Um, you can formally construct them, and they would be valid, of course, if you chose to work on the cylinder, which is what you do in many conformal field theories, right? Uh, so uh, the, the mathematical structures exist. Okay. So if you want to take into account the full conformal group in the sense of string theory, because you're doing field theory on a circle, uh, then the BMS group would contain uh, the full conformal group. We go b beyond SL2C. I read in some places these are like large gauge transformations. I'm going to come to that. Can I come to that later? But they are in some sense. You see, what they're doing is taking an asymptotically flat space and uh, they are isometries of that space in some sense. But of course, since they act non-trivially at infinity, they're called large gauge transformations. That's not, I think, because of any topological content. It's simply they don't fall off at infinity. And I'm going to come back to that very point at my last transparency. So they could take a configuration with finite action and make it infinite action? Well, this is all Lorentzian, and actually, strictly speaking, the action is garbage if you're in Lorentzian space. So uh, it wouldn't... It, uh, you might regulate it or something. Um, but yes, it would leave invariant the, uh, the metric. What, what Bondi and Sachs... Pe well, Bondi started off and Sachs completed... Uh, you take a power series expansion of the metric at infinity. Uh, he was the first to demonstrate, well, Troutman was first, but anyhow, he's called the person that's first to demonstrate mass loss because there's a formula for the flux. And what they discovered is that everything they did was invariant as an asymptotic expansion under this bigger group. And they couldn't fix, there was no way of fixing the um, total energy. Uh, sorry, not the total energy. Uh, the, the, uh, you, could, you couldn't fix the super translations. If you want to get the Poincaré subgroup, you restrict the super translations to just the lowest dimensional harmonics on the sphere, and they will give you the translation part of the Poincaré group. Um, <coughs> the, uh, because you want Lorentz semi-direct product translations, right? So the translations are a finite dimensional commutative sub... Well, all super translations commute, but you want a finite four-dimensional subgroup, so you take the constant plus the three lowest harmonics. Okay, but the Perry et al. use super rotation. Right? Well, they kind of mix it. I don't know. The latest paper mentions this, and uh, in fact, I have spoken with uh, Straminger about this in the past, and he's basically thinking of wires at infinity. Mm. He didn't know what they were. Incidentally, the reason, I, I, this is a slightly cheeky thing, the reason I think that Malcolm is not here today is that Stromich is giving a talk. He's obviously visiting Cambridge, so I think he, he prefers the company of Stromich, unfortunately, to, to that at IHS. But anyhow, uh, any more questions? I, I, okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there are various ways of uh, weakening this. Uh, there's something called the Numerante group, but it's a bit technical. I think I want to uh, pass on. I'll just uh, comment that uh, these symmetries arise in a wide variety of circumstances. We've seen BMS. Uh, they arise in tachyon uh, condensates because in a tachyon condensate, particularly if you're taking a uh, strong coupling, it, keep, it means that the brain is getting very close to being uh, light-like. If you think of the tachyon as a coordinate of the brain, and, uh, and so strong coupling emerges as a Corollian limit of um, the world brain theory. This is something I did ages ago uh, 
with uh, these people, Hashimoto and Ye. Um, you can construct Corollian theories, uh, invariant theories, using, in fact, Surya's method. We used that and we got various uh, interesting things, uh, including the Corollian massive particle, and we also got out of it at some stage the null string or Schultz string. So that was past work, um, and I don't want to go too much on it. I want now to go to the next application. Okay, so uh, what is a plain gravitational wave? There are various definitions, one of which is these are vacuum metrics with a covariantly constant null vector field, and they admit a five-dimensional isometry group, which is the same dimension as the isometry group or the symmetry group of a plain electromagnetic wave. One approach to this is to say the analogue of a photon, well, what is a photon in classical theory? It's a plane electromagnetic wave, we say arbitrary profile, and uh, that you easily check has a five-dimensional symmetry group, so then you say what well, space-times can have the same, and that was done by Bondi and people, Bondi, Pirani and Robinson, uh, two of which, uh, all three of which are now sadly deceased, in the 50s and was a major step in understanding gravitational waves because you could do this at the exact level. It wasn't perturbative. Uh, for, now, what we've recently realised, uh, that started it off on this game, but then we realised there were a lot more things we could do, is that isometry group, it's almost obvious from this, is in fact uh, a subgroup of the six-dimensional Carroll group. And the reason it's a sub, in the relevant dimension, the reason it's a subgroup is that gravitational waves are polarised, so you lose the SO2 generator. If you were just talking about scalar waves, then you'd regain that rotation and uh, the isometry group of uh, scalar plane waves, or the symmetry group, is, is in fact the full Carroll group. Uh, now, that's quite useful because if you've got a group, you can start calculating. I'll just remind some of you of the importance of these uh, gadgets. Uh, they admit a co covariantly constant null vector and spinner, they're BPS, all invariants vanish, there are exact solutions uh, with no quantum corrections uh, of any theory you can more or less think of, but certainly string theory. So they've been used in a wide variety of contexts in the literature. Um, now, they admit two useful coordinate systems, one of which is global and one of which is not. And this is the key to the discussion. OK, the global one was found in 1922 by Brinkman, I think it was 22, and uh, here it is, this is, I is running from 1 to 2, uh, here are our null coordinates, I've changed my convention slightly, I'll explain that in a moment. Here is an extra profile function, this is a 2 by 2 traceless matrix, and you can give it arbitrarily. To solve the Einstein equations, you just give two arbitrary functions of this retarded time view. And moreover, uh, you can superpose solutions which is very remarkable and only true in this coordinate system. Now this coordinate system is global and harmonic, but the one that's adapted to the symmetry group, you obviously have one killing vector because you have the null translation, but there's a three-dimensional three abelian subgroup to the Carroll group, so you can use these coordinates, which are called Rosen coordinates, despite the fact that a better job was done by Baldwin and Jeffrey 25 years before them or so. So this is an exact solution of the uh, Einstein equations. Here is the coordinate transformation. But now you've got to solve a very nonlinear equation. If B is a to the minus 1, a dot, a is a matrix, 2 by 2, then this is K, uh, which is related to the Riemann tensor, and you've got to solve this equation, and uh, that's tricky um, to make that trace free. So uh, another disadvantage of these coordinate systems is that they always break down uh, after a finite time. Um, they focus because they're based on a set of um, uh, null rays, which are well known to focus to experts in the field. But they do exhibit the symmetry manifestly of three translations, two transverse and of course the V translation. So they're, they're useful to use. Um, and. Uh, and, and uh, I'll come to that later. 
Um, the fact that in these coordinates, which is what Einstein played about with, led, misled him to think that there was no such thing as a gravitational wave. And that took a long time to sort out. Uh, eventually people said, well, no, this is the kosher coordinate, and you're using the non-kosher coordinate. Um, so in Brinkman coordinates, the field equations are trivially satisfied, but in uh, Baldwin, Jeffrey, and Rosen coordinates, everything is rather non-trivial. But you can solve for geodesics exactly. It's an elementary undergraduate problem. Now, I want to consider what are called sandwich waves. Uh, so the filling of the sandwich is curvature. There's a before zone and an after zone, and these are flat. OK, this is our view of a gravitational wave arriving at LIGO. It's, LIGO is, uh, the detector is flat, and the particles, we're going to use freely falling particles as a detector, they're at rest. The wave comes through, and uh, then it gets to the after, uh, the, the particles then find themselves in the after zone, and uh, they, in general, will be moving. And we're going to study that motion. Now, for technical reasons having to do with previous papers, my V is in the opposite direction to what it has been on overheads, but it doesn't matter. V shifts you up and down here. OK, so the amplitudes here are the cross and uh, plus uh, uh, amplitudes, and they vanish outside a finite interval. That's the definition of a sandwich wave. And uh, what we're going to look at is what happens. Now, it turns out by a trivial uh, application of Noether's theorem that in the baldwin jeffrey rosen coordinates, if x are constant before the wave, uh, they're constant for all time. It's just the most elementary result. Um, it has to do with uh, translation invariance. And so, um, supposing that Aij was delta Ij before, so you use the same coordinate system, a global coordinate system for one half of Minkowski space. Uh, in general, Aij will uh, not be uh, constant afterwards, even though it's flat. If you impose the condition the metric is flat, there's a two-parameter, well, it depends on two matrices, uh, but there's a, a two-matrix uh, collection of uh, solutions most of which actually focus to a singularity afterwards, which has to do with the focusing effect of the wave. Um, so afterwards, the particles will have a non-trivial time dependence. And that's how you could deduce retrospectively what the wave was. That's the important point. It's, it's related to what's called the memory effect, and I've got a few more slides about that. But uh, if, you, uh, if everybody in LIGO went to sleep and then woke up and said, by golly, that wave must have passed, our, measurement, our, our measurements were off. As long as they'd left a few free particles, then you could reconstruct what had happened. <coughs> in well, reconstruct some things. OK. In theory, but in practice, there's a limit. No, no, no. In practice, this is on the verge. As a matter of fact, you know, with uh, LISA, they may see these effects. It's all very debatable, and it's all at the limits of technology. The description I'm giving you is very simplified. Um, um, OK, so that's, broadly speaking, the gravitational memory effect. Now, different authors give it different names. Uh, a particular case which started this off was given by uh, the postage stamp man Zeldovich and his colleague Polnarov. I realized the other day he actually lives quite close to us in Cambridge. He's down at Queen Mary College. I don't know where actually his house is, but uh, anyhow. Uh, this was explicitly pointed out by uh, Zeldovich and Polnareff in this paper here. And uh, that now the trouble is here that they use the words permanent separation. That's a special case, as it turns out. Uh, and um, I want to do a little bit of self-advertisement, but I excuse it by advertising my, um, my supervisor. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is very clear in linear theory. And uh, one of the things that he inveigled me into doing is working on gravitational wave detectors, thus endangering the remote prospect of my ever getting a PhD. Indeed, 
I got a shift of the whole thing soon, <laughs> saying that they will not find gravitational waves until I retire, or after I retire, and that's the few, one of the few predictions in physics that I've made, which is absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> I retired before the, what is it, <laughs> September 14th. <laughs> okay, so basically they use linear theory, and then it's kind of trivial because uh, they used, uh, a, basically linear theory says Aij is delta Ij plus Hij, uh, and uh, in, in a gravitational wave, the formula for Hij afterwards is equal to zero. And so you can have this. Uh, in fact, we did something else uh, which I want to advertise, just as it's uh, very similar to that. Um, what we actually said was that the real formula for Hij is uh, something like um, uh, Hij, well, what do I want to say? Um, uh, Rij, the one we wanted, R0I0J, sorry, R0I0J, which is basically Kij up to a factor, is something like the fourth derivative of the dipole moment and a 1 over R factor. So if you integrate... A uh, quadrupole, sorry. Yeah, quadrupole. If you integrate this three times and, and the quadrupole moment has gone from constant to constant, you get three integrals of the Riemann tensor. So the memory, uh, so basically what happens afterwards, since the uh, equation for the particle is this famous Jacobi equation, uh, xj, xi, e equals zero. This is the equation we heard in the, pr in the lecture earlier. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. You see that um, by looking at this particle you can deduce this. Um, I mean, and it involves integrals and, 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 and so we were interested in this relation. And it's quite clear from this equation uh, that the generic motion, once this is finished, is linear in, in, in time. Now this is all perturbation theory, uh, but we can reproduce this absolutely precisely in the formalism that uh, uh, one has. Incidentally, there are some people who call this a permanent change of space-time, and this comes back to this question about big gauge transformations. I don't think it's a change of permanent definition, a change of space-time, because it's flat afterwards and it's flat before. But there's perhaps you want to refine your notion of, of, of what a space-time is and use a privileged coordinate system. Okay, you could do this with optics. I won't spend too much time on this, but uh, it. Sorry? The cases when you have at the end the particles uh, in in relative rest. Yes. That requires fine tuning. It does. It does. Fine yeah. tuning the wave profile. Exactly. Yeah, and uh, there's a story there. We tr we've done, done a lot of numerical computations, or at least our colleague Zhang in in Lanzhou. And the trouble is that for the ones we picked they were always moving. Um, now, I think the answer to this is that the notion is somehow that that gets damped out. Uh, Zeldovich and later Braginsky and Khrushchev uh, seem to think those were not so very important. But, so that is the zero energy transfer. Yeah. Yeah, they exactly. The energy and then they give it back. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, now it's a very abstract question. I haven't time to show you them now, but if you read our paper, there are a lot of diagrams of, of, of how the geodesics move and so forth, uh, which can be done uh, very easily um, for certain assumptions. I make the remark here that you can think of photons moving through a gravitational field as moving through a, perme a permeable medium. Uh, it has a permittivity and a permeability. This was worked out many, long, many years ago by Igor uh, uh, TAM and uh, is now used in transformation optics and you can actually find what the epsilons and mu's are. They've got to be equal and they're written by this. So uh, if Aij is not uh, delta Ij but nevertheless flat, you have a refractive medium regarding, if you think of it as in these um, BJR coordinates we call them, the Rosen coordinates. There. Okay, so it's a bit coordinate dependent um, but you could say that it polarizes the vacuum uh, after it's passed. Okay. So there are some subtleties here, and they make a relativist rather uncomfortable. 
Now, after the wave, uh, although uh, Aij is not delta Ij, there is a coordinate transformation which we calculate explicitly, which brings the metric after the wave has passed to canonical flat form. And it's not difficult to find it. Uh, now, the way you could look at this, because that doesn't attend to the identity at large spatial distances, it turns out, you could say that this flat plane wave metric, uh, or that, thus flat plane wave metrics in Boulder and, uh, in Boulder and uh, Je uh, Jeffrey Rosen coordinates, can be thought of as soft gravitons left after the passage of a wave pulse. The pulse itself is non-vanishing curvature, but it leaves a memory of itself if you could track these soft gravitons. Now, from a formal point of view, these soft gravitons are just solutions of the equation for a gravitational wave. It just happens to be that they're flat. Now, we found the diffeomorphisms. That seems to be the necessary uh, assumption to make. It's certainly consistent with standard assumptions in gauge theories uh, to give uh, life to uh, soft gravitons. Are there differences in higher dimensions here? Or this the, everything I've done here will work in all dimensions. Uh, the complications that are talked about by, uh, for example, um, Hollands and, and, and other, uh, what, what's it, who is it? It's uh, Ishibashi and Wald, are related to the fall off of the gravitational field, which is not just power law, but in some cases even square roots and logarithms and, and stuff like that. So uh, that's a, a general issue in higher dimensions and would affect any discussion which is not strictly planar. But we don't see that here at all. I want to emphasize that I, we've said nothing about the sources. I mean, you, at linear level, that was said in our um, old paper and lots of people at the same time. Uh, we know exact formulae for the, dipole, uh, for the quadrupole moment uh, and, and, and the relation. Outside of linear theory, there's a great deal of work which has been done, not least by Thibault, and I just haven't looked into it personally with sufficient precision to make a reliable uh, statement. So I just want to conclude by saying that uh, you know, this body of work is here, so if you want to look up any of it on the web, uh, um, there it is. Thank you for your attention. So, so if you say that the same effect appears in higher dimension, whereas the soft graviton effect is only relevant in four because of the log divergence, how can it be only related? Um, well, strictly speaking, um, f uh, messing around with the BMS group is not necessary for this. You could consider waves. Oh, BMS. I'm just talking about this memory effect. No, 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 no. But the memory effect this is where, where you measure it. You could measure it anywhere. I mean, supposing you're sitting here some bomb goes off, there's gravitational waves at finite distance. Everything I've said will go through, but you'll have to take into account the spherical geometry. You would not notice singularities in the fall-off unless you go to infinity. So it, it will leave uh, an effect, not described precisely by plane waves, it, it will leave this disturbed Minkowski space metric. Uh, and so in principle, you could resurrect some information about the wave. Now, I'm not a great advocate for their um, program. I, I, I've just been slowly working through trying to see if I understand the concepts. Um, I think there's a much more serious question, which is uh, very much the subject of this, has been the subject of this meeting. Uh, these uh, soft gravitons are detectable, that's clear, just as you can detect soft photons, because if you had charged particles, the charged particles uh, will get accelerated as an electromagnetic wave goes through. Uh, but you're talking about things with zero energy by anybody's definition. And then there's an issue of how much on uh information can be carried by something with zero energy. And that's a very debatable thing. Personally, I've never seen a convincing argument either way. Um, uh, but that's what, you, what they really have to face up to. Their calculations so far are entirely classical. And uh, I think... Greenberg interpretation tells you the opposite. That is, 
whatever is really soft is somehow universal and you just have to define an IR safe observable so that all those things are not observable. Well, that's what I would have said. I mean, that's the standard bl uh, block nord uh, uh, statement and that's been repeated by uh, Parati recently in forcible terms. So uh, I don't have enough expertise really to, to claim I understand it, but uh, it's not at all obvious. Um, uh, maybe I don't remember well, but I thought in a recent paper by Strominger, so that's why he was moving into super rotation. Well, I'm, I'm not sure what his motivation is, but I, I wouldn't mess with super rotation. Yeah, that's right. I, I think uh, yeah, they, they don't correspond. You know, Andy has a thing about the conformal group. The way to put in something, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Andy has a thing about the conformal group, uh, and SL2C is too small for him, so he needs the. Whole May I ask Please. me one more question? I mean, uh, the, the memory that you are talking about, <coughs> I think, it's related to, to this time delay that I was talking about. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. If, if you just go to the impulsive limit of your sandwich way, yeah. in which uh, you know, everything is concentrated, mm -hmm. you send the sandwich to zero yeah, yeah. size, but still, Finite energy. Yeah. Uh, no, that's right. Away, then, then you get this time yeah. delay, and uh, yeah, uh, I mean that's in some sense. Uh, then you can what? go to this hyperposexual coordinate, whereas I think for a fat wave, you cannot. Or it's no, no, no. Uh, in fact, I should say that um, you know we have some work in progress on impulsive waves, right. uh, and in fact, part of this began with. Um, uh, a paper of uh, Surya's. Uh, so, uh, so Christian Duval was reading this paper, it comes from the 70s, and uh, uh, Surya considers impulsive waves. Mm -hmm. And then we got into a nightmare um, because uh, the theory of impulsive waves, although often used, when you get down to it, is a big mess. And all of our formulae were being paradoxical because everything is non continuous, etc., etc. So we still haven't sorted that out. Um, uh, but we were precisely trying to get I impulsive waves in the um, Brinkman coordinates are quite straightforward. You just put in a delta function yeah. and it goes through formulae. But what Surya had done was to use the um, BJR coordinates, as we call them. And then the metric is not smooth and the relationship between them has a discontinuity. I didn't expand on the formula, but something called P, which yeah. multiplies the coordinates to get from one to the other. And uh, we haven't you know, got to home base yet on that. So. Any more questions or comments? If not, let us thank Gary again.